And we're live. Um, welcome, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. We actually realized just before getting on air that uh, today we are really literally all over the globe. Uh, we are very happy to be back for virtual IoT uh, this week with uh, um, Alex and um, um, and Brian, sorry, from resin.io. And um, yeah, we're gonna, I actually really like the, the title uh, you guys uh, came, um, came up with, a Strong Devices Weekly Connected, Bringing DevOps uh, to the Internet of Things. So we were um, uh, yeah, talking just before getting live. I think there will be lots of cool demos today. As always, uh, please make sure to, to ask questions to, to Alex and Brian by using the virtual IoT hashtag on Twitter. Uh, you can also comment on Meetup or uh, Google Plus if that's more convenient for you. And uh, yeah, without further ado, uh, I will let uh, Brian and Alex get started with what I expect to be our most popular virtual IoT meetup, actually, according at least to the number of uh, people who are SVP'd. So, Go ahead, guys. Welcome. Um, great. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Benjamin. Um, so let me just start with trying to get my presentation on there. Uh, that means pushing the screen share and then quickly moving here. Right. Um, this, how, how well is this showing up? It is showing up. Oh, great. OK. Cool. So, um, yeah, we're going to talk about strong devices weekly connected um, and uh, bringing DevOps to IoT. Um, I we probably have already hit everybody's um, buzzword uh, quota for the day, but uh, let, let's see how we, we, we recover. So we're just going to do a very quick overview to begin with, and then essentially we're going to do demonstration interspersed with content and at the same time, feel free to sort of send questions, and Benjamin is going to uh, be the intermediary there. And of course, in the end, we're going to have more time for questions. Um, so without further ado, um, we'll switch to showing you how adding a device from the, that is just hardware, uh, naked hardware, to adding it to a fleet on, on resin. Uh, and then we'll sort of give you some more context. We're pushing that first to sort of give it, give, give the demo some time as well. Um, shall we switch over to, to, to Brian? Yep. So a few folks can share, uh, can make me the presenter for a moment. It looks like we've done that. So what I will now walk through, uh, let's not screen share for a little bit. What I'll walk through is essentially the first few steps that a new user is going to go through. So Alex mentioned naked hardware. Um, and, and we'll get naked for a moment, and, uh, and we'll proceed from there. So uh, get ready. Anyway, so we, right now we have a, uh, a fleet of devices, uh, which I will share on my screen to all of you. And we can see that these, uh, this fleet of devices, which hopefully you can all see, uh, there's eight of them. These are Raspberry Pis. They're uh, in our office in Seattle, up in the loft space where I am right now. And you'll see that seven of them are online and showing uh, a very, very simple digital uh, display application. What we're going to do is we're going to take that, that eighth uh, device, which you see in the top left corner, and we're going to provision that. Um, I'm also going to show you now those devices, uh, those seven devices, which are in the resin dashboard. We'll revisit this later. Um, and the first step in adding this device is going to be to download uh, that device image. So I will uh, I'll hit download. Uh, we're connected over a Wi-Fi network here. Uh, and we will start that download. Uh, so what's now happening is an image is being downloaded that has everything on it that needs to be uh, needs to be on it for that device to be able to connect in through that Wi-Fi network credentials that I put in there, um, and then ultimately connect back to the resin service and be ready for a developer to be building, deploying, and managing applications on that device. Uh, in, the interests of, uh, in the interest of time, we're going to skip ahead just a little bit to the second phase, which is uh, taking that image and burning it onto an SD card. And for this, we're actually going to use a, a brand new tool, a, a more than brand new tool. This is something that uh, at Resin we are releasing tomorrow, I believe. But you folks can come check it out right now at etcher.io. Um, and what we're going to do here is take uh, an SD card. Uh, let me 
unshare my screen so you can see the, the, the true activities. We'll take our SD card with that device on it. We'll pop it into my drive oh, on the right side. You folks won't be able to see that, but trust me, it happened. Uh, and then I'm going to go back to screen sharing. And I'm going to open up the, the Etcher app. And you folks can download this uh, from that Etcher I.O. website that I just showed. Etcher is cross-platform, so it's one install that's going to work on Mac, uh, Linux, or Windows uh, workstations. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and select that image that I just downloaded. Grab it right over here. We'll select that new image. Uh, it'll auto-detect the correct drive to go to. So one of the, the other pitfalls of this process is if you actually accidentally map to the wrong uh, part of your file system, you may actually end up wiping out your workstation, which is never good. Uh, I'm going to hit burn, and then from there, it is taking that image that we freshly downloaded, and it is dropping it uh, onto the SD card. And again, I think for the, uh, for the interests of, uh, of demo time and, and all of your mornings or evenings, we're going to skip ahead from here. Typically, this process takes about four or five minutes. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back to that set of devices, and I'm going to drop uh, an SD card into that first device, power it on, uh, and so stick with me for just one moment. I'm going to step away, but you'll see uh, my craftsmanship on the screen. Let's hope I can do this. Oh, yeah, the magic hands of Brian Hale are uh, hearing. hearing. Great. So um, the device you're seeing here is a is a Raspberry Pi, essentially with a Adafruit uh, screen on it. It could be anything else. Um, but the thing that we'll see in about a minute's time is the device essentially having booted up, connected to the VPN, uh, and declared itself into Resin as a new device. Um, so success, maybe. Um, let's see. So, so yeah, what the what the device is doing essentially uh, is it's using the image we wrote to the SD card. Uh, that image, as written to the SD card, had the Wi-Fi credentials in there and authentication credentials for the device to actually sign into the Resin application, um, which it will it, it then uses to uh, sign into the application. And as you can see, it appeared. It went to a configuring state. It got a random name called Wild Moon. So we can change it to something else. Uh, and as soon as the configuration process is finished, it is downloading the software that should be running on devices that are running on this application. So it's essentially downloading a container uh, for the first time uh, that has that sort of small digital signage screen. Uh, now, the first time that this actually runs, it takes a little bit more time than usual because it's downloading the whole container. The next time it'll download uh, incremental updates, but the first one takes a little bit more time. Uh, so we'll switch back and, and talk a little bit more about you know, the context of what you just saw, uh, and then move back to a, a, deployment, uh, a deployment flow. Uh, so I'll, uh, I'll switch to presenting again. Yep, so that was the provisioning demo. Um, by the time we go back to the, the fleet, you'll see the application running uh, on, the, on the device. Now, let's sort of break out of what you just saw and, and think about Internet of Things and how uh, devices are managed out there. Um, a lot of the time, um, it, updates are delivered in the way that you see in this photo, which is people visiting devices, uh, in this case, a, a wind turbine in the field. And this time, our, our, our friend in the photo is lucky because it's on, on land. Uh, it could have been in the sea. Um, so we've, we've seen and heard, as we talk to users, uh, all sorts of provisioning uh, stories from USB sticks in the mail to SSHing in with, with, with uh, you know, running kind of scripts one by one on the devices. And, and everything in between. Um, however, if we're, if we're going to build the Internet of Things, if we're going to have a uh, sort of a future where we can reprogram these, device, these devices in the same way that we do, you know, 
I can I can you know git push Heroku and have my servers update. Why can't I git push something and have my devices update? That was the, the core question that we, we were trying to answer when we started making Resin. Um, we need an infrastructure that works in the same uh, way. So this is sort of a quote from the Industrial Internet Book of the O'Reilly, of, of O'Reilly um, which said, you know, the web ended the annual software release cycle. The, that, the annual software release cycle used to be the case for, uh, you know, desktop software as well. Uh, with the web that ended, um, with the industrial internet and the internet of things, we want to end that for hardware, right? For from, from consumer hardware to big industrial hardware that's sitting somewhere that nobody sees except for the people that really care. Um, to sort of talk about IoT platforms and sort of that kind of side of the of the world, uh, it's important to actually separate things a little bit because there's a lot of things that that, that, that call themselves IoT platforms and they tend to be doing different things. So um, discussing the, the, the problem that we discuss, which we call sort of the code, the deployment problem, uh, it's important to sort of separate it from a, a different problem that's also very hard and also very important to solve, uh, which is the data problem, right? So you would get all of these, uh, you know, we have all these algorithms on the edge, on these devices that are running out there, they're feeding back data into a central server uh, or a cloud, and on there we ran analytics, we ran machine learning, we run uh, event analytics, uh, all sorts of uh, all sorts of processing, from which we draw insights. We understand how our fleet works. We understand what the data is coming back. We we start getting a desire to change what's running out there uh, based on the insights we we got, and that means we make improvements and we want to push these improvements back out. That's where. Uh, what we're talking about today comes in, the, the deployment piece, we getting the, the edge algorithm improved so the cycle can start all over again. Um, to give a, a few sort of high level, uh, more high level uh, factors that we think are coming into this and sort of why is this something that's happening now. Uh, first of all, you know, scale, everybody's talked about scale, everybody's talked about hundreds and hundreds of um, billions or whatever devices that are going to come up, and that's sort of all cool, but we all know that. Um, the interesting thing here is what kind of devices are there. So there's a lot of sensors, of course, a lot of microcontrollers, a lot of RTOS instances running, but more and more we're seeing full-blown Linux devices that are running on an SOC with, you know, gigabytes of RAM, gigabytes of storage, um, something that, you know, 10 years ago would have been my desktop computer is now you know, a tiny device that's embedded somewhere in the world. Um, and what that means is that we need a full-blown uh, life cycle, a full-blown DevOps solution. Uh, the other thing, and I hope a lot of the people that are watching us right now uh, sort of represent that sample, uh, I suspect they do, uh, is that there are, of course, embedded developers, and they've done a great job in bringing us to this point, uh, but there's also millions of web developers and mobile developers and cloud developers, and they work in a way that's sort of taking advantage of all the progress made in the cloud, and increasingly they're being asked to make IoT projects, while at the same time the tooling that they that they expect and they reasonably want uh, isn't there. So all of these things mean that we need to make the make a new toolkit. Um, so with Resin, you get uh, a great development uh, workflow uh, that is, well, actually, this is a, the piece is going to be re getting released uh, soon. Uh, you get a deployment and configuration uh, workflow that we're going to show you right after this. Um, and you get a provisioning workflow. So you've seen the provisioning workflow. And interestingly enough, a lot of our users, before they start using Resin, uh, have something that they've hacked together themselves. And the worst part of that is how you provision a device. That usually takes a long time. How to add a device securely to a fleet, sorry. Um, now, once you've got them in a fleet, you want to deploy code, you want to configure the devices, uh, and Resin allows you to do that. An important thing here is that you can't just do it in the same way you do it in the cloud. So uh, while we take a lot of metaphors from the cloud, uh, we also are, are cognizant of the fact that embedded devices are different. Uh, a very simple way we found to explain this is that the users in the cloud interact with a domain name, right? You 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 send a get a get request to a web server which is load balanced, and you get something back, and you don't know what server actually did the processing for you. 
when I have a smart lock in my house or a drone or whatever other IoT device, uh, my interactions with that device, if that device stops working, I have a real problem and I'll go back to the vendor and say, you know, why did it stop working? If a server dies in the cloud, you know, it doesn't make a sound. Uh, it's another Amazon API call that I make or Azure API call. I have another instance and, and life goes on, which is not the case in, in, in the Internet of Things in the embedded world. So the way we deploy things, the way we've built Resin is to take care of each individual device and make every effort to not lose that device. Um, of course, we want to do all of this securely at scale. Um, and by at scale, we mean uh, in a way that when you start a project, you start small with one device or three devices, and you can grow it to any number of devices and not change the way you work halfway through your project because now you're scaling. Um, and uniformly, whether you're working with an Edison that has you know, Wi-Fi on board and uh, storage on board, or you're working with some industrial board that's got, I don't know, some spinning rust drive and gigabit Ethernet, the way you approach a device shouldn't change. It should be the same thing. Um, so with that, uh, oh yeah, some, some things that nice people have said about us on, online. Uh, I promise there was no uh, financial incentive going either way. Uh, but things like, uh, I couldn't believe how easy it was. What magic is this? Hashtag the future. Uh, um, I haven't been giggling so much in a long time. I uh, would definitely encourage you to, to, to have a look. Um, so. Without uh, much further ado, let me just uh, show you the, the uh, deployment demo. So let's start with uh, my application. Uh, I have my command prompt here. Uh, I'm sorry for the ones of you that got their eyes burnt because I'm using Windows. Uh, this is a solution that works across uh, all platforms, uh, including Windows. Um, so I've got this the application that was that we saw running on on the small fleet is called Simple Beast Fork, and essentially what I want to do is push a different version of the application that runs that shows uh, instead of the resin logo shows the Eclipse IoT logo. Uh, so I'm just going to go and see the images uh, and sort of remove the image I'm showing. Um, and then I'm going to go uh, and insert another image, uh, this one. So, go back to my That's command. a great demo scenario, by the way. Yeah, right, and very, yep. very practical. <laughs> um, And so I've just added it to get, I've committed to get, this is something every web developer, every cloud developer has done at some point. And the slight difference here is that I do git push resin master. So instead of pushing it to GitHub, for instance, I push it to resin. Same way you do with Heroku. Um, what's happening now, uh, if all goes well and demo gods are with us, um, is that the, the new code is pushed to resin. Uh, resin is building the code in an ARM v7 environment. So it knows that the Raspberry Pi that I'm, the Raspberry Pi 2 that I'm deploying to is an ARM v7, uh, and it's emulating that environment in the cloud. So I didn't need to think about cross-compilation or tool, ch tool chains. Uh, it all happened uh, transparently for me as a user, but the container that comes out of this is gonna be able to run on the device uh, normally. So we are uploading our, our image to the registry, and this is the unicorn. This is what you see when you successfully deploy code uh, to Resin. The Resin is saying the code is up, right? So let's uh, go and see what uh, is happening to our fleet. So the fleet has gotten the message that there's a new version out. Uh, they're downloading it. Obviously, this is a very small update now, um, also because it's optimized for a demo. Um, but uh, with, with Resin, uh, something that we're releasing very, very soon is in beta now, is container deltas, uh, which essentially allow a, um, a device to download not just the, not the whole container, not even the Docker layer of a container, but the absolute minimum delta of the files that changed. So the devices have all changed. Let me go and show you. Uh, what the fleet looks like right now, as soon as I can spot my browser. 
Uh, the people that were wishing me ill for using I'm Windows. I'm showing it on my screen as well, Alex. Yeah, please go ahead. Okay. Yeah. I would need to be made presenter. Hopefully people can see it in the lower right. All right, uh, here. I've, I've got it if, if that's fine. So you can see that the device is actually, I caught it in the last moment. Uh, they've all changed to the IoTEclipse.org. Uh, great domain. You should visit it if you haven't. Um, so that's, you know, that's how a push works with Resin. You change your code in your computer, you push, Resin does the rest, and the devices are updating, and, and your code has the ability to do anything that you would do in a container, plus talk to the hardware directly. If you run something that talks to GPIO, I, actually this example talks to GPIO, the screens are talking through GPIO. Uh, that just works. Um, so shall we continue with the, the presentation. Uh, am, I still, am I still presenter, by the way? Yes, you are. Oh, perfect. OK. Uh, so that was the deployment demo. Um, while we're waiting for the slides to load. Yeah, so this is essentially what we just saw, right? A developer pushes. Uh, we build for a different environment. We push the container out. There's a VPN that's connecting uh, the device to the server. And this is important, not for the obvious reason, you might think, so security. Uh, it's actually important because a lot of the times we can't reach devices out there. Yes, they are on the internet nominally, but they don't have an IP. They're behind a NAT, they're behind a 3G network, uh, and the VPN means we ha can have a uniform way to connect to those devices as a resident. This is not something the user has to take care of. Again, when we provision the device, it connects automatically. Um, so from there, uh, the devices pushed feedback to us as they were updating through the API, which the developer in this case saw uh, through the user interface. Uh, one thing that's important to note is that the user interface for Resin is just another API client. That data that we have on the fleet is available over a you know, beautiful sort of JSON API, very, very restful, um, that can be used either directly or through one of our SDKs to embed that information into a higher level panel. So if you're doing a signage application, you may want to inject some domain specific information like uh, what is the screen currently showing? Uh, that's absolutely fine. That's the way we've designed Resin to work. Uh, so like we said, it feels like a cloud platform, except for the fact that we are covering a number of issues underneath. So it's architecture agnostic, it, the updates are lightweight, and the deployments are fail safe, which means that even if I pushed a container, maybe we should have done that demo, uh, that was wrong for some reason. So it compiled, but it failed to run. I would be able to push again and get my devices back. Uh, because uh, the operating system is always there, it, it never stops running. Uh, and as such, um, it, uh, it doesn't lose connectivity and it's able to take another update even if the whole container stopped working. Um, now, moving back to our fleet, what if I wanted to do something like um, move, uh, sort of have some kind of a, a workflow, like uh, maybe I don't want to just deploy to all of my devices at the same time. Maybe what I want to do is actually take one device uh, and put it in a separate uh, sort of commit to a separate version of the code, work on it there, and then if I'm confident about that code, uh, I can start moving more and more devices into that version uh, so as to do something like a stage rollout. So how, how would you do that with Resin? Essentially, uh, what you do is you go into the device, uh, into the actions. Again, all this is available through the API as well. Um, and you move the device into a different, uh, what we call a different application in Resin. Uh, so yeah, I have a, another application called MicroBeast Alternative. Uh, by the way, the name of the application, MicroBeast, is essentially because uh, we we have the largest uh, Raspberry Pi cluster in the world. I think it's no longer the largest, but it used to be at one point uh, of 120 devices. And then that was very big. So uh, we would have a smaller one that was 24, and we call that the mini beast. And then that was also very big to have and heavy to carry. And the, the, therefore, we make, made the micro beast, which is what you saw, the eight. Uh, anyway, so what I've done is I've asked the device to move to a different application. Uh, Resin shows me the new application. It has some other device on there uh, called BitterC, and Wild Moon itself uh, is in there. Now, uh, this will take a few minutes, but essentially what it does is, um, sorry, let me just check something. Uh, what it does is it moved into this new application. It will realize that it's running the wrong, quote unquote, uh, commit. Um, 
and that it should run a new one. Uh, and as it as as that happens, it will download the new commit and it will run it. So it will essentially conform to the application that it got moved into. Uh, and that sort of uh, workflow can be used to do all sorts of development paradigms and uh, production um, workflows. So I don't know if it has done this already. Oh yeah, it's so it's it's uh, it's actually doing its thing. Uh, let me just check. Yeah, uh, let me see if actually we can see it on the on the fleet camera. Uh, so the device is still uh, showing the old commit. Yeah, and as we can see here, it's still showing the old commit. It hasn't really noticed yet, uh, but it will. So let's move back to the presentation and check back on it in a few minutes. Um, so uh, let's talk about device support. So we showed the Raspberry Pi. All versions work. Uh, a lot of the famous sort of devices you you might have, like you know the BeagleBone, the Edison, the Parallel Board work, uh, Odroid, Hummingboard, uh, and then sort of the Intel Nook and some more sort of obscure uh, devices like uh, you know the Nitrogen or uh, things like that or Technologic Systems 7700 work. There's a lot of devices that work out of the box. But the important thing as we were building resin was that we would support any kind of device uh, that you know meets some minimum uh, performance standards. Uh, to do that, we are essentially using the Yocto project. So our you know the operating system that's running on the device we call it you know resin OS, but effectively it is the uh, the Yocto BSP consider it a recipe uh, for how to build a Linux for a specific board uh, and minimal Linux that has just the bits that are needed. Um, and then we add essentially the resin uh, parts on top. So by using a BSP that's out there, and there's hundreds and hundreds of BSP, the, the Yocto project is is large and very exciting and supported by some very, very large companies. Um, we can take one of those BSPs, the board support packages, as they call them, uh, and adding the resin layers on top, we can get resin support for a specific board without having gone out and done the work to, to specifically support a uh, device. Very often manufacturers will come out with a Yocto BSP for, for the board that they support and if you really need to and you've got a custom device that was, is one of, one of a kind, uh, you can make a BSP for that one. It's, it's a process but it's, it's doable so, and therefore through that you can have resin support uh, for this board. Um, another thing we'd like to emphasize is that um, we are in the process of releasing all of our core technology. Everything you saw today to be able to run a fleet with resin. Um, it's taken us a little bit longer than we'd like, uh, but we're definitely making progress. Uh, we really should have started as open source, but that's, uh, that's I guess, uh, you know, a, t a time travel question. Um, everything's re getting released as an Apache 2 license. Enough of resin that you can run a fleet without our permission or our, our help. Um, we're founding members of the Open Container Initiative, uh, especially our, our uh, emphasis is to make the container world uh, take into account the embedded specific considerations. And of course we use open standards wherever we can find them. So I've mentioned a few, like Git, the Yocto project, of course Linux, uh, using the Apache license, the Open Container project, now it's called Open Container Initiative actually. And our API is uh, close to the OData standard, we, we, we try to approximate it, uh, get closer every day. Uh, but we essentially try to use open standards wherever we wherever we can. Um, yeah, so if I'm if I'm leaving you with anything, it's just uh, you know just try it. If you've got a, a device that's sitting, a single board computer that's sitting in, on your desk, it probably works on resin already. Uh, just visit resin.io and sign up. And let us know what you think. Uh, I think that actually concludes the presentation, as far as uh, I have it. Uh, yeah, we are, we're happy to take any questions. Excellent. So I think uh, people who are watching since the beginning, they will agree that I didn't lie when I said that there would be some cool demos. It was very complete. Uh, so I think we already have a few. Um, 
a few questions uh, lined up on, on Twitter, but a uh, kind of reminder that we're still around for a, for a few more minutes, so uh, please make sure to tweet uh, your questions using the virtual IoT hashtag. You can also comment on meetup.com or even the page if that's more convenient. So there's, um, uh, there, there's a question from, from Boris. Um, well, so as you mentioned, you guys are definitely going to uh, uh, try and embrace uh, more uh, open source, which is great. Um, but the, the question from Boris, and I will, I guess, tweak the question a bit, is uh, what's the, um, uh, how would you compare um, uh, what Resin.io does uh, to uh, open source projects like Eclipse Hawkbit? Uh, which maybe you guys are not uh, very familiar with, but it's uh, yeah, essentially an open source um, uh, framework for managing um, software provisioning and uh, software rollouts and stuff like that. Yeah, extending the questions to um, what's your competitors, basically? Is there anything uh, already available in the in the Docker community for, for doing remote management of Docker containers and, and the like? So, yeah. Um, if you're looking to do complete fleet management uh, of sort of fairly standard containers, uh, whether that's you know the de facto standard, <laughs> which is Docker or something similar, or something similar to that, uh, nothing exists out there. Uh, it's a, it's a hard project to build. Honestly, we've, we've it's taken us about three years to get to this point of maturity. Um, it, that we we believe that this is the future, so we ha we have to you know believe that others are gonna. Uh, build something like this. We don't believe that we will be alone forever, but so far as we know right now, uh, there isn't an equivalent uh, sort of project uh, project available. I don't know, uh, Benjamin, if you have uh, something that you're aware of that you would sort of put in the same category. Well, uh, besides, uh, I guess, Eclipse Hope bit, which is well, just getting started at Eclipse, but uh, which aims at providing the, the server side Foundation at least for for um, managing the um, yeah the, the hosting and, and the uh, even like doing some sort of CDN for for actually hosting the the, the software packages all over the globe so as yep. they are uh, physically close to the devices and stuff like that um, yep. yeah I'm, I'm not sure there's anything equivalent to what you guys on the agent side I would say on the on the devices themselves yeah. Yeah. So, but yeah, it's a it's a, it's a good question and one we definitely keep thinking about ourselves all the time. I think as as Alex referenced on that very first slide, if you remember the the dramatic slide with the wind turbine, is is actually somewhat representative of of what the alternative in, in the market today is, right? Which is DIY. Now, the the USB stick in the field is admittedly a fairly rudimentary version of that. It's very manual and requires physically being there. Uh, and then there's a few steps beyond that that people will try. Um, logging in and running scripts and maybe stitching a few things together that feel sort of automated. Um, but the reason Resin exists is because ultimately those solutions are manual, error-prone, slow, and, and dangerous, or some combination thereof. Okay. Um, so yeah, back to the topic of um, uh, the Resin.io agent, or I don't know how you call the, uh, the stuff that one is supposed to run on, on the devices itself. Yeah themselves. Yep. Um, so, um, yeah, question from, from Julian. Uh, I think actually some guys from your team already answered uh, on Twitter, but let's ask uh, it live for all the, the viewers. Um, so, yeah, you mentioned that basically the requirement is any uh, Linux slash Yocto based device, but what's the actual uh, minimal footprint? Uh, could I run a resin.io on something like the Arduino Yun? Which yep. is a, a MIPS processor, about four megabytes of flash. Um, do you guys have experience with that? Yeah. So there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of answers to that question. Actually, it's uh, it's interesting. So I guess the straightforward answer is the smallest thing we've run um, the device, uh, you know, resin on is a Raspberry Pi A plus, which has got 256 megabytes of RAM. So that's the smallest thing we know resin today will work on. Um, I will say that we're in the process of rewriting the agent to take up less RAM, but even if we did that, uh, the UN would be a little bit uh, further out than our, our capabilities today because it's it's running MIPS. And honestly, you know, Docker for MIPS hasn't gotten there. We've done some advanced experiments internally, and we you know we might we were the team that got Docker working on ARM, 
Uh, we might have to be the team that gets Docker working on MIPS too, uh, which you know we're fine we're fine with doing. But there's there, that's another obstacle. However, uh, one thing I will say, and this is not something we've sort of said publicly before, but um, we're also working on an extension, essentially, of what you just saw today, to uh, be able to manage microcontrollers, full proper microcontrollers. So you know, an Arduino that's not working, uh, that's not running Linux. Um, through a gateway that's running Linux and is managed by a, by a resin. So uh, while you know resin might not be running directly on that device, uh, through the gateway you'll be able to see it as if it was a full and proper uh, resin device with all of the features like the terminal, log collection, and all of those things. So there's you know as I said there's a few a few answers to that question. Unfortunately, the uh, the, the straightforward answer today is no. Uh, but we're hoping to improve on that very, very soon. Okay, well, thanks. Uh, well, uh, yeah, the answer is no, but as you said, I mean, uh, yeah, you gave some uh, interesting um, um, input as to what's uh, what's ahead and what's what's planned for the future, so that's quite interesting. Um, so I think Manu asked a question or to answer a question on Twitter, but it doesn't have enough in, in 140 characters to ask the question, so maybe we, we, um, we, we wait for, for, for a bit. So, um, yeah, you, you guys mentioned during the, the presentation, or actually before we started, but I'm not sure you um, actually um, uh, yeah, uh, ex explain in, in much detail. You guys provide your own uh, tools to actually help people um, create their SD cards very easily, right? Uh, yeah, the, that tool, by the way, is not specific to resin SD cards. Any SD card you want to write with Etcher, uh, you know, you're you're essentially it's essentially an advanced beta, but it's uh, supposed to do the same thing that you know any SD card writer will will do, just in in a way that uh, we feel hadn't been done before. Um, so I think we might actually be running out of uh, of questions. Uh, so you guys are on Twitter, right? Uh, what's Absolutely. the best way to get in touch with you guys? So yeah, so that's uh, another thing to say. Of course, you know we're we, we're we're on Twitter. We are on you know Facebook. You know LinkedIn. Should you want to talk to us through LinkedIn? Um, but um, honestly, the the best way to to get in touch with the team. And the, the the channel that we monitor more than anything else, and we have uh, real resin I/O engineers on, is our support channel. So essentially, when you're using resin, if you look at the bottom right, there is a question mark. Unless you're using an ad blocker, which you should <laughs> kindly disable while you're on resin, because we don't serve ads. Um, but you'll see a question mark, and essentially that's uh, intercom. And any question that gets answered there, our our sort of our median is under 10 minutes. To answer it, uh, at, you know, and that includes all times of the day and the weekend, uh, because we have a team that is very, very distributed. So we're we're able to sort of somebody's always there, uh, but that's a way. Definitely, we love talking to people. The other thing, which is starting up recently, is our Gitter community. So if you go to uh, Gitter.im/resin-io/chat. Um, or just you know find out the link somewhere. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, you will see our uh, see our Gitter community where uh, we have a lot of fun uh, talking to our users. But most interestingly to us, we see users talking to other users and helping out and sort of sharing knowledge about projects and you know all sorts of uh, things that you you might expect users to sort of discuss between each other. Uh, we see there it's a it's a very active community, and I'm you know personally extremely happy to see that sort of starting to take off recently. Okay, cool. One uh, um, one last bit before we wrap because we we don't like loose ends in our demo. I've, I'm showing the fleet uh, on my screen now. You actually see that one device oh, that yeah. we moved to a new version of the application uh, went through its download while Alex was uh, presenting the last few slides. So you'll see there's that new version of the application with our our favorite device, Wild Moon, which is currently online, uh, and then the seven remaining showing the the Eclipse IoT logo, whereas Wild Moon is on a version of the application that it has recently downloaded and installed that is running the more standard Eclipse logo. So that process did take place in the background while we were chatting. Yeah, absolutely. 
Great. And by the way, I, I knew uh, we uh, we should wait a bit more for uh, for more questions. And while we were chatting, there's actually uh, a couple of great questions from from Alan on Twitter, uh, which I definitely need to send your way, uh, uh, Alex and Brian. First is, um, how does A-B testing capability work? Like if I yep. want to do selective push to devices, depending on, I don't know, the physical location or whatever, um, how does that work? Yep. Yeah, so essentially you would use uh, the, the primitive we showed, right? So you would have two applications with to which you push, you know, the A and the B versions essentially of your, uh, of your code and then move devices between them as you see fit. Maybe as you know, version A proves itself to be more worthy, uh, you move more and more devices into it. Um, so you can actually not only just have uh, you know, selective push, but you can also do live in the physical world, you know, sort of testing between variants. Uh, you know, it kind of sounds insane when I say it, but you know, there's, there's nothing that's between you and doing that, uh, just using resin as it is today. Okay, um, and more questions coming. So the second one from Alan was, um, and I guess uh, we should have asked before, um, what is your business model, guys? Well, what's the catch? <laughs> uh, Brian, do you want to take this one, actually? Sure, so everything, as we mentioned before, everything that you've seen in this demo um, is capable of being reproduced in, in open source resin, which we've talked about a fair bit along the way. And then our business as resin is, we run that service today. We run a service that provides that software to our customers, uh, and we support it. Um, and for that, we charge monthly subscriptions, um, which if anyone is, of course, interested, we'd be happy to have that conversation. But uh, it's critical to mention that the first five devices are free of charge. So nobody Absolutely. you know, uh, has to pay us if there are developing something or testing something or they got a few devices in their friends' homes. That's something we absolutely love people doing and we, we don't have com commercial conversations uh, in the early stages of the project. project. The, the, the number five is intended to be there so that um, you can, uh, you know, you can have a conversation with us to have, have us help you <laughs> when you're going to scale. We have a project that grows a little bit larger uh, and we found that people want to be, have that relationship, right? You, you depend on resin quite heavily when you're, you're, you're running a fleet. Uh, I wouldn't be comfortable doing that for free, honestly. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. Um, maybe that's the last question. Who knows? Uh, slightly more technical from Julian. Um, so in the demo, you were basically pushing um, bit repo. Uh, aren't you concerned about the fact that it It's going to make the repo uh, very heavy overall performance when you will start hosting like lots of versions of the different um, um, of the software. Right. So this is uh, this is important to mention. We are not pushing binaries into the Git repo. So essentially, what we're pushing is source code uh, to Resin, and Resin builds the code. So the binaries are actually getting built in the cloud, and that creates a Docker container that we then send to the devices. And again, we don't send the whole container to the device. We send, uh, well, in a few weeks, we're going to be sending uh, deltas of the container to the device. So you can actually send the minimal updates uh, on every step of the pipeline. Uh, right now, we, we do the standard Docker pull. So you have layers. And again, it's not as if you're sending the whole thing. But we want to improve on that uh, by a lot with our delta functionality, which, is, which can do uh, up to 100 times better, uh, depending on, on your container. But uh, yeah, no, absolutely not. You should not be uh, putting binaries into a Git repo. So, so your so the, the actual compilation of whatever native artifacts um, I may want to, to use in my software, the, the compilation actually happens on your cloud then. Correct. If you if you wanted to, yes, it does. It's okay. it works like a standard pass, you know, like you would with Heroku or Cloud Foundry or you know something else. The the compilation happens on the platform side. It does not happen on your machine. All right, that makes sense. Um, so I think we are uh, we are now running out of questions. That was actually very uh, a very interesting presentation. And um, well, the um, for those who are watching the recording, uh, if you have some questions, um, 
we will make sure to um, to give you some pointers as to how to contact uh, the great folks at resin.io and you can certainly comment on, on YouTube uh, directly and we'll make sure to um, yeah, to, to forward the questions to, to, to the team. So I think we will be back in, so let me just um, check. Yeah, we will be back on April the 20th uh, for, for our next virtual IoT meetup. So the, um, the topic will be MQTT Spy. Um, MQTT Spy is a, a nice tool for, uh, for testing MQTT communication scenarios. So if you have an RS for, for this um, webinar, make sure to, to do so, uh, to get the, the kind reminders. As always, we are happy to get uh, your feedback on uh, how we can improve the kind of topics you would like us to, to cover uh, in those uh, meetups. And um, yeah, with this, I think um, we will call it today. And um, we thank, again, uh, Brian and Alex. It was really great to, to have you guys. Uh, I hope you, um, you enjoyed um, uh, doing the presentation as much as I enjoyed. Bye bye. Take care. Thank you. Bye. Bye.